Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames concluded their first Eastern road swing of the year, and we have saw a bit of Jekyll and Hyde hockey from the team this week. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to break it down for you. And Matt, what are your thoughts on what we saw out East this week? Well, this looked like a typical early Calgary Flames start to the season. Um, the Flames did not have a training camp, and usually they struggle for the first couple of weeks anyway, and... Just the little details in the game seem to be lacking at times in all of the games this week. Yeah, they had camp. They just played no exhibition games. And, you know, this is really a team that hasn't played a lot of hockey since the bubble in, what was it, August? Yeah. So, yeah, I think you're right. It's it's just, I think, a lot of clean up details. But let's, let's jump into it and take a look. Um, on the 26th last week, that was... It's weird to think that we're almost in February already. On Tuesday, the Calgary Flames were here in Calgary uh, playing against Toronto. And they ended up losing uh, 4-3 in that game against the Leafs. Calgary had only one shot for the whole first period. Um, Better second for the Flames, but as we usually see with them, they turned over the puck way too many times in the first two, and it cost them the game. What do you have to say about this one? Well, this is more of a type of a game that the Flames played last season where they got shellacked in the first period entirely and then oh we're trailing now we have to pour on the gas and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and then they finally got the equalizer and then they stopped playing and then they lost you know, when you talk about your team identity, like you said, this is a very Calgary Flames hockey game. This is not what you want for your team identity. No, like this team, they seem to have a regular pattern. And it, it's odd because like I, when I watch other teams play, even consistently, like it, they will have their ups and downs, but it's not as predictable. Um, whereas like the flames, you know, that like, if they have a really good first period, they're going to have a really bad second period. And in, if they have a really bad first period and they're down by multiple goals that they're going to throw everything at the kitchen sink at the other team until they tie the game and whether or not they continue to push forward or get to overtime or whatever, you know, like it, it's too formulaic and this team they need to learn how to mature as a team to figure out how to start the game well then okay we had a good first period it's zero zero have that mentality okay it's tied let's go win the second period and this team doesn't seem to have the mental focus to go out and win a period and then go out and win another period and then go out and win another period. They struggle to play more than 40 minutes a game. Yeah. And like, how would you say like back in the, after the first lockout in 05, 06, 04, 05, uh, that chunk of years after that, the Flames would have inconsistencies in their game, but that was more due to a lack of depth more than anything. And, like, this team has the ability to run four lines effectively. They shouldn't be able... Like, shouldn't be having this kind of really inconsistent from minute to minute... Like, you look at, like, a team like Chicago when they were doing well. Like say like the flames are playing the blackhawks the flames might have three or four or five good shifts in a row but the bench would be communicating with each other they'd get their stuff in order and reset themselves and take it again back at the flames or whomever they were playing and like there was always a constant group in the team that would be like rallying the troops and i think that part of what the flames problem is is that they're not they do not have enough vocal leadership on the blue on the bench to bark at the other you know it 
and I think you can even see this being emblematic when Bill Peters was hired the first season, he was barking at the team and the flames responded with a 107 point season. There's no leadership on the bench. It seems where it's just that internal, Hey, we're screwing up. Let's get our feet moving, get back in this. You're not seeing that very much. And that's one of the concerning things. Well, let's come back to this idea in a little bit here once we talk about the other games for the week because I think you're right about a lot of those things. And I think that was even more evident in the first Canadiens game when the Flames went uh, to Montreal on Thursday the 28th. David Riddick got his first start of the year in this one, and the score probably doesn't tell the story. It was 4-2. The Flames got their two goals late in the third, really not having any time to get this back. Um... But, you know, it was an, it was another one where the Flames played a good first and had no energy in the second or third. And they and against a team like Montreal, against a good team, you can't do that. It just, things started out well, and I would say went downhill after the Flames' first penalty in this one. Um, yeah. The only good thing I saw was I thought Josh Levo played his best game as a, or his best period as a Flame in the first, but that doesn't say much in such a big lo- big losing effort. Yeah, this team, like, it, 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 they just did not have anything to respond to Montreal's way of playing. And, like, Montreal is a decent team, but, like, if this was a normal setup t- uh, in terms of a season, like, Montreal's not a playoff team in the Eastern Conference. And yet the Flames just had no ability to counteract anything that Montreal was doing until the last three minutes, in which case, you know, what Montreal's like, yeah, we've already won. We're just kind of playing out the minutes here. And, oh, you scored twice. Meh, who cares? Yeah, it was not a good look for the Flames. And like you said in the Toronto game, I thought it was a very stereotypical Calgary Flames game. They came out playing well. They had some adversity. They didn't respond to the adversity, and they fold it up and stop playing the rest of the game. Yeah, and, like, you've seen this with the the Flames over the past few years. Anytime they encounter a faster team, like, Montreal isn't blazingly fast, but they have a lot of quick-ish forwards. It's like they lose their entire structure of how to play hockey. And, like, yeah, the other team is in on you, But this is where, like, calmness on the ice and a lack of panic is necessary. And it's almost like the team acts a bit like Sam Bennett when he makes a mistake. And he tries to correct it. And he overcorrects. And and then he takes a penalty. And it seems like instead of just, like, okay, yeah, they they got the forecheck going and all of that. Instead of like just collapsing and letting them skate around a bit and not force things because it seems like when they force things they get themselves out of position and you know holes open up and scoring chances happen instead of being calm they run around a little too much trying to respond and they're just not having the effect of method to play against a faster team and like this team isn't slow by any stretch but they just don't know how to cope defensively with that kind of an attack and it's one of the things that they are going to have to learn if they actually want to advance in the playoffs because they're eventually going to face a faster team and if they're not going to be able to adapt to that, like they're going to get skunked again like they did against Colorado. You can't wait for the playoffs, though. You've got to be able to respond no, I know. to that during the regular season. No, I know. But like the end uh, run is like the postseason as well. And, you know, like if you're, you haven't been able to, like you can have enough success to make the playoffs even facing teams like that. But if you have no answer, then like once you encounter a team like that, you're you're hooped, and like the Flames need to figure out over the next couple of months how to f- play against a team like that who can play with speed, and how to just 
remain calm on the ice. And I think that they just... I don't think they have a couple months. If they take that long, they're not making the playoffs. True. I think they've got a couple weeks. Yeah. Um, this is such a tight division here. Um, so the Flames then played the Montreal Canadian again Saturday night. And I don't know about you, I was worried about what we're going to see from this team. We tend to see that when they get adversity on their side... Um, adversity just keeps piling up and piling up. And I expect a terrible game out of the flames. The big news before this one was the boys held a players only meeting before the game talking about having to play with more emotion. And I think it worked because they came out in the first, I would say they played with great emotion right through the first two periods of this game, got on the board early with the Johnny Goudreau goal. Um, and then not another one till the third period with Michael Backlund, but ended up with a two nothing win. I don't think they necessarily, Oh, played uh, Montreal. It looked to me like a very playoff game, but they they kept their their composure and their will the whole game, and that's what got them the win. Yeah, I frankly, um, this is a game that um, where Markstrom earned every penny. Um, he uh, like this game. If it wasn't for Markstrom standing on his head, honestly, I thought I think this is a five-one game for Montreal. You think so? Yeah, like if Riddick was in that, I think it's a five-one game. Like it, it, I thought the Flames were. They they did have more intensity than the first Montreal game, and they were more mentally in it. But boy, were they sloppy throughout the game and Montreal had way too many scoring chances five on five and like when the f it was five on five like I thought Montreal was just simply all over Calgary after the for the one nothing goal and like it, that was not a very good team effort again like it, it, I, it, I think that like Markstrom just literally stole that one because the Flames, I don't believe, deserved two points in that one at all. Marstrom definitely kept them in it, but I, I have to say at least that I think that um, I think that the whole team looked pretty good for the first two periods. Although they came out in the third, they started making some blind passes, blowing chances, took a penalty there. But I thought for the first two, they didn't look you know really good, but they looked much better than we saw before. And I think we saw a lot of improvement. And that's the kind of game that against a lot of teams – would be an acceptable first two periods. Yeah. It, I'm not saying like, oh, it was a repeat of the first game. They were markedly better than the first one. It's just that that wasn't good enough. And yeah, they got the win, but this, it, this was more of a winning in spite of the game itself. And like, I, I think, like, if you play that exact same game over again ten times, the Flames probably lose that one eight out of the ten right. times. Yeah. And, you know, it's... Like, it's... A lot of the same disconcerting things about the first game were present, except the Flames were more emotionally involved, and they tried a little harder right off the bat. And for me, I guess that's why maybe I'm looking at it as more of a positive, is if the Flames come out with that kind of emotion you know, nine games out of 10, they're going to end up probably winning it or being in the hunt right till the end. Oh, I agree. It was a good and building blocks game. Like this team, it, if you're just basing it on talent, like this team should be first or second. It, and it, the Flames need to figure out a way of playing the game in such a manner that they're actually maximizing their own talent. And... Like, we saw that a bit in the first three games before the five-day break, that, like, they were playing cohesively, and it's just that there's been so many breakdowns and just general sloppiness, which, that's, like, leading off the show, like, that's why I mentioned, like, the lack of a preseason and that they struggled typically early. You know, a lot of these guys just aren't in sync right now. Like you, you saw like but it's Michael not just Backl in sync, Matt. We've had the same core for what three, four years. They've never been in sync. No, and um, and that's why, like, I think that like this past off season with the cycling out of guys like Brody and Hamannick for 
promotion of Rasmus Anderson and bringing in Tanev helped just to, you know, change the identity of the team a bit. And I think that, like, if this kind of thing keeps continuing, I think that the Flames will continue to have to keep cycling people out. And you've seen that in other situations, like, say, the St. Louis Blues, where they had to keep cycling guys out until they got the core that worked for them and uh, or washington for that matter well, let's and, come back to this idea in just a sec if you're okay let's wrap up the week yeah. and i want to discuss this a little bit more yeah um so just a few notes on that montreal game um michael backland had a an nhl goal against every team but the montreal canadians coming to this one so now we can complete the set and look forward to how to score against seattle um another thing is David uh, Jacob Markstrom had five shutouts his whole time in Vancouver, and now he has two and six games of Flames, so he can easily get his career record in one year this year, I think, if he wanted to. Um, and the other note on this one, Dylan Dubé back in the lineup. Yeah. Well, I, and I think that that is a huge, huge uh, thing for the Calgary Flames. I think that a lot of what caused... Um, the slide in the three games was the absence of uh, Dylan Dubé because the Flames just don't have the depth on the right side. So if you're lo losing one of your two key right wingers between him and Andrew Majapane, it just it puts more of a magnification on that and it screws up everything, basically. We'll talk a little bit later in the show. Maybe there's a way to go and acquire a right winger, but we'll bring that up a bit a little, little bit later. Um, before we get back to the topic you were talking about, let's just look at where this puts the Flames. That win against Montreal puts the Flames at 500. They're now 3-3-1, three, three and one, but they sit sixth in the Scotia North Division with only Ottawa below them with three points. The Flames now have seven points, and they played seven games. So pretty much point per game to this point. Not too bad. The uh, leaders, Toronto and Montreal, are 15 and 12, respectively. So that kind of shows where we're at. So, Matt, let's get back to that idea you had about cycling guys out and maybe having, having to do more of that. To me, my big question there is how long can they keep doing that? You've got this core. This core's contract's starting to come up. Like, this team has to be good now or they're going to run out of time. Well, and that's the thing. Like, if that's the case, then maybe you step back a little bit and rebuild a little bit you know and you know that does happen unfortunately like say if this continues to happen maybe you have to look at trading Gaudreau and Monaghan making Kachuk your guy bring up kids struggle a little bit and you know new draft picks bring them in and you know, but I mean, for looking at that, two, that's a five it, to seven year process based on what we've seen. I mean, that pretty much says, you know what, we blew our contendership. You know, yeah, well, now we got to wait that, to do it again. And it's one of those things that you can only respond to the situation on the field as it happens. And, like, if the Flames figure themselves out and, you know, rise in the standings accordingly then it's a moot point and, like, let's see what's going on in the postseason. But if, like, we're seeing the same script that we have the last couple of seasons where, you know, the same problems, the same struggles, and it doesn't stop, well, then there's a, you know, the, it, you we've changed the coaches so many times, the general manager, like, it, it literally, the only thing left is the players, and at that point, well... You know, and you're not going to be, like, giving guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan away. You're going to get other things in return. So, you know, it's not... I Like, I don't think that if the Flames were to trade off players to make those changes... It's just like the line A for uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois trade. Like, yeah, Columbus gave up a really good player, but they got two really decent ones in return and vice versa... You know, like, and I think that, like, if the Flames do make a move, like, they're going to get, either get good prospects or good players back. So, like, it's not going to be, like, a full, like, step back and, like, go into oblivion mode and then come back. I, so, I think it's... 
you and I have talked about the idea of trading some of this core for a few years now. And as much as you're right, they're not just going to trade them and, and get, you know, nothing for them. It's not going to be the Jerome McGinley trade. They are going to get something. But the question is, why hasn't it been done? And as much as I like Tree as the GM, the first place my mind goes when you're saying that is, do we need a GM who's willing to pull that trigger? Well, the thing is, is that Treliving has always been willing when it made sense. And, like, Dougie Hamilton did not fit in with this team. And he pulled the deal, and it's worked out rather well for the Flames. And, like, the Gaudreau and Monaghan thing, they are two of the elite players in the NHL. That hasn't changed. It's just that the whole nature of the team hasn't quite clicked. And... You know, like you but it can just only... seems like he's trying to build around those guys instead of just ask the hard question of do I need to move one of them? And I have well, no doubt and... that I, I have no doubt the right trade is out there, and he's probably discussed it with teams. Yeah, and it's one of those situations where, like, you can't unring that bell if you make the deal. Like, that's it. You've made the deal, and you have to know. Like, is what Gaudreau is. Like, is that all he is, or can he flesh out his game? Same with Sean Monaghan. Like, if that, what they are, like, two years ago, is the finished product, well, then, you know, you d still don't have that information yet. Goudreau, like, this now, year and next year, how long do you give him to figure out what he's got? He's 27. The, the, well, this year. And, like, if the Flames basically... My line of thinking is... If the Flames season mirrors the last couple where better than average regular season team, like first or second in this division, and then, you know, suck in the playoffs, even if they w beat one of the 3-4 teams and then lose to Toronto, well, you know, like, that's all well and good, but, um, y you know, like, you haven't actually done it, made any forward progress so that's when I would trade Gaudreau, like, at the draft and look for, you know, either futures or, you know, some situation, like, say, with Philadelphia, like, for a Konechny or something like that along those lines. It seems like and... they've made every other possible move, doesn't it? Like, they've they've kept those guys. They brought in Lindholm. They brought in, you know, other defensemen. They have a great goalie now. It seems like that's the only thing left to do. We've trained – we've gone through how many coaches – well, that's the, the the thing is is that the single hardest thing to do is get talent, and the Flames are one of the three or four most talented teams organizationally in the NHL. So they both have the depth and the high end skill. So if what the they are on paper isn't actually translating and manifesting in results, well then you have to, you know, give that a hard look. And, like, two years ago, they fell flat on their face. Last year, they should have beat Dallas, but, you know, Dallas's tenacity overcame. You know, like, if that storyline happens again, then it's like, well, talent be damned. You know, this team can't figure it out. And it's like in past... Like, I'd say we like, already know they can't figure it out. I'm not seeing anything to tell me that one more season's going to do it. I know. And I agree with you. And it, like, what... If I, you know, had the general manager's hat on, I would be looking at, is there a trade that makes sense, both in context of the season now and moving forward? as you get through this season and into next year or like the off season, then, you know, you have more information like, yes, the flames definitively did not make it over that hump. Then. Okay. Now it's time to like cut with those players. But I guess at what point do on. they just say, well, we'll try it again next year. We'll bring in a right winger and try it again. Like at some point, what is that metric of enough's enough? Well, I think the playoffs this year, I think, like, the final straw for me would be if the Flames can't get out of the first two rounds. Like, if they, you know, and, you know, full credit to Toronto. They're awesome as a team, but their defense and their goaltending is not 
up to par with the Flames. Like, the Flames, in a seven-game series, should beat Toronto. And, you know, like, Toronto, as a playoff team, is not built properly to win in the postseason. So Calgary should beat Toronto. Do you worry that... Like, you you said kind of out of the top two rounds, though. Do you worry that even if we get into round two, they almost look at a success over the past or that we did equivalent and you keep the guys? No. Like, honestly, like, the last two years, okay, you lost a couple of hard series. The first one against Colorado was a very hard lesson. Last year, Dallas was a damn good team and went to the finals and gave uh, the Lightning a fairly good go of it and you know calgary like honestly if calgary beat dallas there there's equal chance that they could have done the exact same thing as dallas did last year and gone to the finals it's like now it's time that okay you did those things those things happened this is like the single final straw if you can't actually get over the hump then there is no way that this team is ever getting over the hump as it sits. Time to actually make core changes, not just, you know, dancing around the deck chairs, like literally main guys going. And, like, uh, this is the final straw this year. Like, if they're, you know, and if they get to the conference finals and lose to, say, Colorado or whatever, that that's fine. That's acceptable because of the fact that, like, you're going up against another elite team, and if you lose against an elite team in the conference finals, that I think just even in that case, though, you've still got to look at how much did say Goudreau Monahan contribute to that every year. Monaghan oh, for sure. And Goudreau go, you know, they they don't show up, and if if we make it to the conference finals, being led by the Gachuk line and let's say the Backlund line and that quote unquote second line doesn't show up, I think like to me, oh, you've yeah. got, it, to me, I think I you got to make the move unless you get the Stanley Cup this year. You make the move either way. Yeah, I th- I agree. It, if in context, you know it. I don't have hard. any any reason to believe that Goudreau is going to look better in the playoffs this year than he has in the past. Yeah, and like honestly, I would sooner trade just Goudreau than trading both Goudreau and Monahan, unless the deal made sense. Well, and, and like, I don't think you're going to do one deal for both of them, but you might do. I think you would have to pull off a couple deals. Yeah, I know. And the, the biggest thing it, I think that works in Calgary's favor, and we talked about this last year, is Goudreau's contract is six point seven five. Show me a bona fide left winger in this league making less than eight million dollars right now. Yeah, exactly. So in a cap crunch year, I think we could get more for him than we might, you know, in a non cap crunch situation because it's a great contract that you're giving somebody. Oh, for sure. And you'll get that premium. Like, it, it would basically be about the equivalent of a mid to late first round pick worth of value just from the cheapness of the contract. It, it'll be interesting to see. Like, is, this... is the team that we saw against Montreal this week the Calgary Flames of this year, or are they just having a bad week? Yeah. Like, if what we saw is what this team is, the same up and down not very cohesive blah team that's just going to waffle through the season and then lose in the first or second round, well, then, yeah, you have to change. And, you know, like, make Kachuk and Lindholm your top two guys and everybody from Backland, Monaghan, Goudreau, like, basically anybody over the age of 25 can go in the right situation regardless. Well, I and, think, and you and I haven't been able to find the name, but I think you move either Monahan or Goudreau, probably Goudreau because it gets you more. You bring in a right winger to go with Kachuk, Lindholm, and then you piece together a new second line. Yeah, like uh, Manjapane, Monahan, and Dubé. Yeah, or I mean, or something we'll, we'll, like talk, that. we'll talk about Bennett here in a little bit. He might be able to get you something there, but I just... I can I can understand not trading Goudreau midseason with all the logistics around trading right now, and we're even saying that with the line A deal and guys having to sit out. But to me, this is a deal that should have been done this past off season, especially with an extended off season. I fully expected the Flames start the season without number thirteen. Yeah, so did I. But 
I can un with all the uncertainty of everything and like I you, well you even saw in free agency where like nobody was signing anybody. I think that everybody was just kind of playing this whole season by ear and not really rocking the boat too much because like you didn't really see many shake up deals at all in the off season where you do on occasion and. You know, it'll be interesting to see. Like, there, it, there's a lot to respond to with this team. And, you know, like, this all might just be the early season, typical, you know, October struggles that this team have. But and, even you then, know, I'd be being... willing to move Gujo for a guy that can play 82. Like, we can't have a whole team that doesn't come alive until Christmas. Oh, I know. I'm not arguing with you. Um, it's just right at this second there's not enough information yet i don't that, know about that, that we've, be, we've this guy, uh, these guys aren't new we've seen these guys for how many seasons now oh i know and they're learning new lessons uh, you know it as much as it's easy to be dismissive of like oh well this, this guy's a veteran well sometimes like the first like the colorado series really knocked this team on their ass and they needed to respond and figure out how to play better. And to give them credit, last season in the, the Dallas series, they should have won five of those six games. Okay, and they didn't. And that's but they, I know, and but that, that was a learning experience. It, you know, like they didn't get blown out like they did against Colorado. They went out against the team that went to the Stanley cup finals and they were the better team. And it was due to just dumb bounces and a bunch of bad luck that they didn't. And it's one of those things where like they were markedly better and they still lost in the first round. But you know, is there that next step? Like, going from Colorado to how they played against Dallas, is there that next step? But you're step looking at the playoffs, they're... though, Matt. I think we've got to look at the 82 games. To me, they didn't look any better last season as a team. And those play Sean Monaghan, I think, has evolved his game. Johnny Goudreau is not. The guy looks the same the year before Colorado, yeah. last year, this year. He's not making strides. We can't look ahead to what they do for us in the playoffs if we're going to struggle to get there. Um, I'm actually going to disagree with you thus far this season i think that goudreau's actually been probably the flames best forward um he in still to me of... looks very one-dimensional yeah and the thing is is that like i'm think of uh pittsburgh when they won their back-to-back -back cups you had guys like malkin and crosby but they also had phil kessel who just chipped in offense and just as terrible in every other aspect of the game. To yep. me, Gaudreau is Phil Kessel. He is just awesome yeah. at scoring goals. And he was that way too. And, yeah, and he is terrible. And if you can man... Like, that's why having him on the second line is a great thing. Because... A, he doesn't face the top defenders, because now that's Kachuk's job, and because they're equivalently talented offensively, you know, <laughs> yeah. Has Johnny it's... looked better this year because he's better, or has he looked better because he has a better makeup to his line? I think that Monahan's made a lot of strides. I think Mon is working well there. Is he just better because of some of the parts? No, I think that he is... How would you say... Um... Gaudreau, when he's feeling it, he's got a little bit of cockiness and swagger in how he moves on the ice. It, it It's not something tangible. It's just, like, like, last season at times, like, he was really fighting the puck, and, like, it would skip on him, and, like, there was just, like, little hiccups in how he was doing things. But, like, this year... It seems that, like, the passes are working, the shots are working, and, like, the cohesive plays are working, and, yeah, whereas no, last I'll year... I'll give you that. We just have to see if that continues. I'm not sold yeah, that after seven uh, games he's a different player. No, it's it just... it. You're seeing, thus far, more of the 
like 99 point Gaudreau, not the what what was last well, season. And I think what you said was key yeah. when he's engaged. Like if I guess the question then is if we don't trade him, how do we get that Gaudreau for 82 games? Well, and that's like where did this team learn the lessons from like going from Colorado to Dallas? Have they learned those lessons of how to actually win and like what it actually takes to be gutsy to like the sacrifices that Dallas made in that series to just grind it the hell out, even though Calgary outplayed them in five of the six games still win the series. And did Calgary's players take those lessons and are applying them? And like, as the whole team has struggled in like their three, three and one through seven games, like they're not doing great. Individual components seem to be whether that continues for the next 49 games. We just don't have that information, but there's enough where it's hard to say like right this second what because there's just not enough information it's frustrating and like the instinct to say trade Gaudreau or trade Monaghan is perfectly valid and like if they didn't learn any lessons and this is just this a rerun of last season well then yeah you you have to I'll disagree with it's your just... thoughts that there's not enough information. We know what these guys are. Maybe one of them has a good season, but I have no reason to think that one of them has turned a corner, will look better for every season after this. I think we have plenty of information, but it's a yeah. variable of how does this season look. It's not like there's a new player. Monaghan, to me, has looked more complete. I agree. So, like, and... And, and I've said to you for how many years on the show, Monaghan is a second-line center. Yeah. It... <sighs> It's yeah, it, right. And, and this I whole think... team, this whole team is insanely frustrating <laughs> because. And he, okay, let, it's let's like a, they let's got assume, it. Let's but... assume Goudreau does look good this year, okay? And I agree with you. There's some been some glimpse of it this year. Even from an asset management point, though, does it make sense to move him? Even if he has a good oh, yeah, year, like do you move him while he's hot. Well, I don't think we're that... going to be able to afford to re-sign him. Well, the thing is, is that. Like if the flame basically if the flames aren't in the Stanley Cup Finals this year, I think you have to trade Gaudreau regardless, just because like guys like Dubé and Manjapane and whomever are going to need more dollar contracts mm-hmm. and so on. So you know, just from an asset perspective, you have to I think move you know because you can't lose Gaudreau to free agency no and even if he has the best year he's ever had then you're just going to get more for him but I think really either way this year you know unless we say our lifting Lord Stanley's mug with no fans around Gaudreau's got to go I think just from an asset perspective he's got to go yeah and you also have to look at like both uh like Dylan Dubé, Andre Mangiapane, uh Jacob Peltier even uh, Connor Zari, they're all left shooting guys that can go on the left side. And so, you know, just from a organizational makeup, the Flames have a lot of primarily left side guys. So, you know, like if you're getting something, like say you're trading Goudreau for a decent right-handed mm-hmm. guy. You're going to do more you, favors for the team moving them for an asset. Yeah, like even if you're trading Goudreau for, say, a second line right winger, like a 50 point second line right winger and prospects and draft picks, well, you know, you can just slide Mangiapane in on the left side of that line or Dubé on the left side of that line. And both of those guys are second line players, so they're not out of line on that line. It, yet you've increased the right side. You know, like, there's permutations that work, and, you know, like, it's not like the team's just going to sink to the bottom. Well, and and even if it's not those guys, you now have six and a half million to go shopping if you need to. I mean, you know, looking at guys who might be free agents this year, I mean, I can even see a guy like Nick Bjergstad out of Minnesota who might come in as a second-line guy. He's a right shot. Um, you know, just different guys that are, you know, Joel, Joel Armia, like guys that you could probably get for less and still make out, you know, move, move Goudreau for a right winger, bring in another right-handed guy and you've still got some left-hand depth. Yeah. 
Yeah, like, I, I think that the Flames will still need to fill out, like, the third and fourth line spots effectively as well, and... I just, yeah, I don't know like that Dubé and, and Mangiapane are ready to be that number two yet on a, on a you know, deep contending team, so that's why I think you might have to bring in even another right or left winger. I think you can put one of them on the second line, but I don't think they both go there yet. Yeah, and... Like, that's where, like, if the Flames were to needing to step back a bit and, like, retool a bit, like, that would allow guys like Dubé and Majapane to grow into those kinds of roles. It Overall, like, this team, like, they the talent level they have is good. It's just, can they figure out the intangible side of it? And there's glimpses... And there's glimpses on the other side, too. For sure. And, and I so, think at some point you it's... just have to, like, you're right. There's always something to learn, but we can't forever be learning. At some point you have to put a deadline on it. And no, see if we I, I agree. If we haven't figured and it like, out by, say, end of this year, it's time to make changes. No. And, like, if at the end of this season it results in the Flames not being the division champion in terms of the playoffs and going to the conference finals, then, yeah, this team needs a restructure uh, and a big you know big names big everything you know shake it up let's go and like give kachuk like it this would be kachuk's team then and even if it isn't already and you know make him the guy and carry on and i think that you know it it we're at after the first month and you know we have a really good goaltender, <laughs> and there's been flashes. For sure. And, you know, what? whether the 18 skaters can figure out how to... Like, Noah Hannafin, I'm going to single him out on the defense score, has looked absolutely amazing mm-hmm. this season. And, uh, like, number one defenseman and, you know, best defenseman on the team. And, like, that is a huge... Like, keep it up. Like, you know, like that would solve so many problems for this team um, moving forward if he can keep this level of play up. And, like, just overall, like, this team, if they can sort things out, like, Yusuf Valimaki's struggles and, like, the third and fourth line struggles, like, if they can figure those things out and start having more cohesion overall the wins will pile up it's just yeah this team is frustrating (laughs) talking about changes and making changes and the change that might happen sooner than the goudreau change or any other changes sam bennett it was reported saturday night on hockey night in canada that uh, sam bennett's agent has let the flames know he would like a quote-unquote change of scenery Um, which, as we know, probably means a trade. We've got one year left on the Bennett deal just this year, and then he's an RFA. So, Matt, i got a couple questions here. First off, are you surprised to hear Bennett wants out of town? I can understand both sides of how Sam Bennett's been handled. Sam Bennett has the skill where he could be a legitimately good second-line player. If every game was the playoffs. The problem is, is that Sam Bennett doesn't know how to handle when he makes a mistake and he's it's been how many years and when he does make a mistake and get out of position he overreacts and he ends up in the penalty box he's been here since more often than not he's been here since uh 15 16 and you know like that is fine but like it's hard to trust a guy to be a top six forward and getting that 15 16 17 minute Mm -hmm. ice time if every time he makes a mistake he might take a penalty and you know part of it is on sam bennett that you know if he were able to play that chippy edgy game without stepping over the line he would have already been given opportunities on the first and second line consistently yep it's just that you can't trust him to not put the team at a major disadvantage and that's part of the problem and 
And like I, he does and I have... think and I think in negotiations next year, his people are going to come in and say, "Look what he does for you in the playoffs." The Flames are going to say all the things you said, and but you sucked during the regular season, and we can't pay you two and a half million for playoff performance. And you know, like Sam Bennett is like if I was another team's general manager, I'm knocking down the door to get Sam Bennett. It's just... Yeah, but again, there's all the flaws, like you said. I think you really have to look at how are GMs going to evaluate him. Are they looking at his regular season play, or are they looking at his playoff play? Well, and that's the thing. Like, if you're a middling team, and you're looking to get somebody that you can kind of give more of a leash to, to try to... You know, like, not a playoff team. A team more like... Edmonton or Ottawa or you know some of the just weak Florida Panthers where if the guy you know you throw him out there on the first or second line and if he does take those dumb penalties it doesn't really matter because your team's not really going to go anywhere anyway in hopes that he figures it out on those first and second line and emerge you know that offensive skill emerges it's just that the Flames are too good of a team. And it's just like with Oliver Shillington not playing. Oliver Shillington is an NHL defenseman. It's just that the Flames have six guys that are better than him. Yep. Both guys the have been given chances. Yeah. And the Flames forwards, they have guys that are better than Sam Bennett. That's not Sam Bennett's fault. That's not the Flames' fault. You know, you have flaws in your game that's preventing you from pushing up the lineup that's you know you have to work on that and if you're not you know if you're taking the attitude of oh well, you know i'm not getting given a shot well at the end you're of the, the day pick in team history doesn't mean we give you the first line automatically you know like you have to earn it you know like you've been in the league for what five years now yeah this grow will be a up. sixth season you know grow up one well, and, and to be fair, we don't know that that's what he's upset about. Um, we can surmise that, but no reason has been given. Just to be fair to him and his agent. Yeah, no, and I'm under the assumption that well, you know, he's not getting the chances that a fourth overall. I'm under pick the same should. assumption, but it's an assumption. Let's just put that out there. Yeah, and you know, his argument is valid, but. You also have to look in at yourself and be honest with yourself of, well, why am I not being given these opportunities where a guy like a six round pick like Andrew Mangiapane is getting those opportunities yep. and Dylan Dubé, a second round pick is getting those opportunities. What are they doing? Do you see Dylan Dubé taking stupid penalties? Do you no. see Andrew Mangiapane taking stupid penalties? No, they're playing that physical edge game. You saw that Dubé hit that. Uh, well, I think against... a better example of those guys would be Luch. Luch plays with an edge, and you know he ends up in the penalty box sometimes, but he's not taking stupid penalties every shift. No, and even Ronaldo's in the penalty box less than Bennett is. Yeah, and it's one of those things that you know you have to have that introspection of, okay, if these players are getting those shots and I'm not, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. And I don't think that Bennett has actually done any self-reflection on the whys of that this whole situation. Because talent-wise, Bennett has that ability to be where Mangiapane or Dubé is. And, you know, if he you removed the dumb penalties and mistakes out of his game, he could easily slot in on the first or second line and fit in well and he could probably be a 50 60 point guy on this team today but you can't trust him because of the way the lack of discipline in how he plays because power plays are so vital now they've always have been but like even more emphasis now that you know you get past if you know, because like if you've got a guy like, say, Dylan Dubé, who's going to be a 50 point guy being a first line forward versus the hypothetical Bennett being a 55, 60 point guy, again, hypothetical, 
but Dubé is taking like maybe five or six penalties all season, where Bennett's taking like twenty twenty five. Well, you know, the, the just the amount of goals against is way more than that differential. So you're not going to want, you know, the that difference in potential for the offense. You're gonna want the guy that's gonna cause less issues for you. <laughs> So I see this shaking down in three ways, and let's talk about each one of them. The first way, I think, is you ignore it, you taxi squad him, and you re-sign him next year only to dangle him in the expansion draft. What do you think the likelihood is of that happening? As much as, um, you know, like, he wants a trade, uh, you're under contract. Yep. So unless you want to sit out and, like, damage your NHL reputation... <laughs> You know, like, there's no real rush. You know, nope. if the trade makes sense and, like, the Flames are getting the better end of the deal, sure. But is there any rush to go do it tomorrow? Pfft, no. So that brings me to the other two, I think, possible options. One is that we move him for a roster player. And at that point, we have to ask, what would we get in return? How often when a guy asks for a trade, do you see a fair return? You never really get that. We'll put the line A deal aside because I think that's an exception. But usually, yeah, you had two guys who wanted out, and so they're like the general managers were like, "Hey, I have a yeah. problem. You, you have a problem." Usually, you get Yay. pennies on the dollar. The other option, <laughs> yeah. and I can see Tree wanting it, is let's move him for a non-roster player. Let's free up two and a half million dollars in cap room I can play with later. And I think both those have merit. So I'll give you my thoughts on both of these, and then I, I'd love to hear yours. Looking at the roster, the Flames have. None of the new guys that have come in have, I think, impressed as much as they should yet. Uh, you know, Josh Levo, uh, Nordstrom, Simone, they're not, I think, a guy that you look at and say, yeah, they can take, you know, what Bennett could provide here and you move Bennett for a non-roster player. I think there's some some benefit to that, but I think you can get something for Bennett. So if I'm going to move him, of course the deal has to make sense. But I think that you can find a team that would want him. And a couple options I came up with. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, move him to Vancouver for uh, Vertanen. That would be a perfectly viable trade. Vertanen's been kind of grumpy in Vancouver. Well, it's it. Two guys that need, it, need know, a change of scenery. And they both kind of are the same situation. Both high-end draft picks that have felt that they haven't gotten a fair shake. Perfect sense. And, uh, it, like, if that deal got made, uh, yeah, that would make entire sense. The other one I could see, send him up the QE2 for Jesse Pooley-Arvey. That would also be an interesting thing. Edmonton is trying that. to use Pooley-Arvey as a first-line right winger, and I don't think that's what he is. But in our middle six, I think you could get more out of Pooley-Arvey than we're seeing up north. Well, honestly, to with Edmonton's players, I would always take anything that... Edmonton's tried to develop because they're inept at it <laughs> you know and like I think that Pooley Garvey could be the player that he had the potential to be I also think that Edmonton's just so bad at developing unless the guy is a star prospect like Dreisaitl and McDavid where you couldn't possibly screw it up because they're that good and that's why like the second around and beyond draft picks for the Oilers always seem to fail because they just are inept when it comes to developing players. And the last guy I'll give you here, and I'm, I'm trying to look at what the flames need. The flames are deep at center. We could argue that, um, you know, deep on left wing too. deep on like, left, which Ben, fills both those boxes. They need right wingers and both Pooley RV and Vertanen are right. If you want to go with, and it's funny you mentioned Florida because they were another team I was looking at. You, I could see them making a move for a guy who just got put on their taxi squad, which is Owen Tippett and something. I think Tippett is a good bottom six tweener guy. Um, I think there's more potential to him than we've seen, but I think you'd need to throw some in with Tippett. Yeah, that would be like Tippett in a third or maybe a second. Yeah, or a conditional like, there. Yeah. Third that turns into a second if, you know, Bennett only has five penalties all, all season or something like that. Yeah, I could see that. Um... I mean, we're not, yeah. this is not the Goudreau deal we were talking about earlier. You're not moving this guy for, and I think some people, when I've seen some people talking about on Twitter, yes, he's the highest pick. Yes, the first round pick. You're not moving him for a top right winger. You're moving him for another tweener, or you're moving him out for picks. Yeah. Like, at most, you're going to get as a third line right winger. 
frankly, or a prospect that's kind of waffling like Pooley Arvey. And that's why I think Pooley Arvey or even Vertanen, you've got two other guys that are in a similar boat. The teams would probably like to get rid of them. There's similar money, I think, in all three guys. I think you sort of like the line A deal, but on a smaller scale, you find two guys that need a new you know, a new uh, home and you just move them for each other. And I think that also tells the player, okay, Sam, you think you're better? You're now in Vancouver, Edmonton. If you have the same problems, maybe you're not actually better. Maybe it wasn't the Flames are mismanaging you or, you know, Vertan and you come to Calgary and you still struggle. Maybe that's who you are. It's not that Vancouver was mismanaging you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like the, it's frustrating with, the players like this because the like they do show flashes but then the but like we were talking things. about earlier though right we can't keep a guy who's really only good in the playoffs we need a guy who can play 82 games especially as a as a bottom six guy and you talked about getting the bottom six going maybe we just need to put a different piece in there yeah and if it was up to me what i would be doing is saying okay sam we're going to give you that shot. You're because I'm under the assumption that the complaint is that he's not getting a fair shake. And you go play right wing with Gaudreau and Monahan. Because the second line's been kinda iffy anyway. And we'll give you five, six, seven games. It's up to you. I would play argue great. he's been given that shot in the past. We've seen him on I that know. top right wing. Uh, yeah, and I agree. But you know, a it would if he doesn't like it would help to showcase him anyway. And b it would spread out the depth a bit cuz you'd have It could Mondo showcase Monier, him, Dugue. but it could also make him look inept if he doesn't do well on the first line. Well, yeah. But you know, it's uh well, here you're wanting this here. You got it. Your game. You do it. You know what, though? And, I, I and, Yeah, I, I and, know I know where you're going with it, but I think, you know, looking at the guys who are on those right wings, like Levo and Mongepenny, I wouldn't just put them there. I'd let them know, you know, you want this? Oh, play those guys. It's your job if you work for it, but I'm just going to give it to you because I don't want you motivated by when you complain, we'll give you what you want. I agree. But uh, you've had you seven say, games. Work your way well, up. Well, how would you how would you say this team? I feel like on the overall, they need the proverbial boot <laughs> up the rear end to get them going. And you know, like you have a, a guy like Bennett who is complaining and all that, and. While it wouldn't necessarily be fair to reward him specifically for that, it's also a boot to him of, okay, you've been complaining that you're not getting the opportunities. Put up or shut up. But I think you can do it on the third you know? line. You can say, you know, Sam, we'll put you up there if you can stay out of the box for two games. Like, I don't think you just put him on the first line and the second no, line. You say, uh, show us you can do what you can do where you are, and if you can do that, then we'll promote you. Yeah, and I that's, you know, and he has been, like, last game he got some power play time and looked okay. And I think that, like, if they can, you know, do this, get this marker, and then, but eventually give him that shot. It, you know, it tells him that, like, either your expectations of yourself are unrealistic or you've taken that next step. And if you've taken that next step, then you're going to get what you actually want. So a trade isn't actually necessary. But like we've already talked about with other players, is there any indication that he's, that he's better than he was? Like, no, uh, but... You know, when is it up to the player is, to show the, that versus the team giving that I opportunity? I know. And the under normal circumstances, it would be like, ah, who cares? But that playoff guy is the only reason why I jump over a little bit of hurdles to try and make it work. Because playoff Sam Bennett is worth trying to figure it out. 
Because if you can get him to play that right way during the regular season and he emerges in himself to be that good second line right winger, then, you know, you get the benefit of playoff Sam Bennett in the regular season and the postseason. And I think that, like, this season especially is both a figuring out, like, a final uh, report card on everybody and, you know, having the ability to determine whether... You know, and giving guys a shot where they might not necessarily deserve it, like, say, Sam Bennett, to let them figure out, you know, like, a once and for all, like, this is what you are. So, you know, we feel more comfortable in dealing you because, meh, there's not, you know, like, okay, great, you show up in the playoffs, but you're not I think really... we're going to agree to disagree on this one. I think the Flames, yeah. the Flames know where they think he is. I think your best bet for a guy with one more year is not to try and do what you're saying here. I think you move him to a team that's going to give him more opportunities. Say, Sam, we're going to move you to insert team, uh, Vancouver, Edmonton, Florida. They will give you that shot. And you know what? You have no contract at the end of the year. If you prove somewhere else you can do that, we'll give you a call. He, yeah. You know, he's an RFA. I mean, I think you could easily deal for him back. We even saw when the Flames moved uh, Furland, they talked about bringing him back the next year. Like, to me, I know what you're saying, but I think right now is not the time to experiment. We know what he is. He really hasn't made much of a notion that that's changed, I think. And there's no right or wrong. I think we're just going to agree to disagree on this one. But yeah. I'd say move him on, let him try what you're saying somewhere else, make that their problem, and let's instead get a new guy in who we can get integrated quicker. Yeah. and If he doesn't want to be I, here, I don't want him here. I can understand that point of view, and, you know, like, it's... If Sam Bennett wasn't as good at, in the postseason, if he was just decent, it then it would be, yeah, you know, just get rid of him, who cares? It's just that that second level that he has in the playoffs is worth fighting to keep, if he can figure it out, and that's why... I'd, like, normally, a situation like this, it'd be like, turf that guy, because, you know, who cares? But that second gear there, that's hard to find. And if they can figure out a way to placate, like, what he's wanting while, you know, being true to the organization, so to speak, and, you know, like, can make the situation work, that would be ideal. Second would be, yeah, you trade him but for... But who'd have thunk that Sam Bennett would be that playoff warrior? We have other faces that maybe if he's not there will step up or have that chance to step up. Like, maybe the new guy will. I think, to me, turf him. Let someone else deal with that. And if he is if he is good playoff Sam Bennett, maybe have a discussion in the summer and say, Sam, you're not worth two and a half. You're good in the playoffs. We'll give you 900000 to come back here as our playoff guy. Yeah. You know, like, I know what you're saying, but I think if you don't want to be here, I don't want to try and experiment with you, fine. We'll move you somewhere else. They can try that. They can move you on the top line. We can see what happens with them over there, and we can always call them back if, if things look really good. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those, either which way, it does make sense. So, I it... To me, if you're going to trade Bennett this season, I think you you don't do the Florida trade. You have to trade within the Canadian division. I mean, it's not a huge deal to have you know a third line guy out for two weeks, but I think there's enough trade material in Canada that if you're going to do it, you do it within the Scotia North division. What do you think? Yeah, uh, that would be my ideal, and yeah, like even if it's to Ottawa or Montreal, like there there's some guys that are interesting on those teams as well. Yeah, I think I would I would rather trade him for either Vertanen or uh, or Puliarvi than what I'm seeing in Ottawa, Montreal. For me, yeah, I can agree with you there. And you know we've got Edmonton in like town my, this coming Saturday. Like we could my just... my order of preference would be Puliarvi first, then uh, Vertanen, and then you know insert a whole bunch of different adequate guys like Adam Lowry or uh, Cop or. You know, like there's a bunch of guys that are in that decent third, fourth line role that could make sense. Yeah. It just, yeah. 
Yeah, and we see both Edmonton and Vancouver the next two weeks. So, I mean, it's it's easy, you know, when you're seeing that team and you got nothing else to do these days, you might as well sit around and try to make a trade. Yep. So, I just, I think that Bennett will be out of here sooner rather than later. Uh, we talked last week about an, a story that didn't so much involve the Flames, the Baby Flames. I remember when they used to be called that, when they were the Flames. But the AHL affiliate potentially moving to Calgary, and it's done. Uh, the Stockton Heat will be playing out of Calgary. They'll be the Stockton Heat of Calgary. Um, or the, I guess, Calgary Stockton Heat. Um, they'll be playing in the NHL or in the AHL's Canadian division this year. Still to be determined the number of games they'll play and exactly who will be in the division. But as of now, it'll be Belleville, which is Ottawa's team, Laval, which is Montreal's team, Manitoba, which is Winnipeg's team, Toronto, which will be Toronto's team, obviously, and Stockton, which will be Calgary's team. Um, so we'll have more information on that coming up. But Matt, I want your thoughts here. With these guys now in Calgary and being fairly accessible call-up wise, how do you think that changes the usage of the taxi squad? Right now on the taxi squad, we have Derek Ryan, Connor Mackey, Oliver Shillington, Michael Stone, Louis Domingue, and uh, Ronaldo, Zach Ronaldo. To me, I think your taxi squad, you get rid of guys like Mackey and Shillington who have some value to play in the AHL. I think your taxi squad is your Brett Ritchie's, your you know Buddy Robinson's, all your guys who you know can step in and play at the NHL level and aren't going to gain anything with AHL seasoning. Yeah, like the Alan Quines of the world or the yeah. Derek Grants, the, you know, it, you know, uh, to use a baseball analogy, the quadruple A guys, the guys that are not quite major league ready, but uh, not like would be elite AHL guys and just have the vets there. And yeah, I agree because they can just hang out and yeah. Well, and those are the guys that, and we talked about this in the past too, is, you know, if you get an injury or if we trade Bennett and we need someone to step in for a couple days, those are the guys that I feel comfortable. I don't know about you stepping in for, you know, two, three games. If we need a, if we need a Matthew Phillips or someone like that, we can easily bring them up now, a Pospisil or somebody like that. Um, but the guys you want traveling with the team every day, the guys that aren't going to lack not playing games. Yeah. And um, speaking of, uh, Pospisil is one player that I think would probably make the NHL this season. Um, but I, I think really... he still he would still do better playing AHL games than riding. Oh no, the I I know. I I'm meaning like more towards the postseason. Like uh, assuming he has a good AHL season, like he would probably be my number one call-up guy because of the fact that he plays that physical game and can chip in. He'd yeah. be a good, like, third, fourth line physical banger type that, for the playoffs, would be a good fit. Yeah, or again, if we need a guy for a week or two weeks because we've, you know, moved Bennett to the States and we have a hole for two weeks, that's where maybe you pull him up for that time. But, yeah. like, Connor Mackey, I think, can uh, benefit from AHL time. Oliver Shillington, I think, can benefit from AHL Definitely. time. Michael Stone is a great taxi squad guy. Like you said, Alan Quines. The, I think we have enough of them, and I could even see the Flames go out and get one or two more of them just to sit on that taxi squad. But I think, to me, this really changes things. Of those young players you want to look at, you don't keep here anymore. You send them, quote-unquote, to the farm, which pretty much means take your bag and go to the next door on the left. Yeah. And you're still going to get plenty of time to see these guys with, I don't know if they're going to practice at the Dome with three teams once the Hitmen start playing. That's going to be a lot, but management will still get to see them. A lot of times they were keeping some of those young guys around to see them. You can easily see them. you got nothing else to do. Just stick around for an extra two hours and watch these guys, you know, when they're practicing. Um, and, and they're playing all in Canada too. So even if it's not here, hey, we're in Toronto, let's go watch the, you know, the Toronto Stockton game. Like you'll you got plenty of time to see these guys if you want to see them. So I think you'll see yeah. anyone with some developmental value assigned to the AHL. Not necessarily they won't come up, but they won't be like I think Connor Mackey, you're wasting him having him ride the pine on the taxi squad. Yeah. He still needs some seasoning there. And you know, you mentioned last week even Zega Doolin. I mean, this makes that possibility of Zega Doolin coming up, you know, much much easier and even if for a game you said okay you know riddick is out Deming is the backup we need a goalie on the taxi squad hey zag just sit there doing nothing but just to be there um you know maybe take morning skate with the team or whatever yep 
So it'll it'll make the whole thing I think makes everything easier for the the Flames to evaluate guys to you know watch them to call them up and down and like you said Pospisil might get one game or two games now where he might not have before because it wasn't worth the quarantine time to do that. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so we'll see. Um, it definitely creates a lot more flexibility overall for the organization. Like if say Matthew Phillips is tearing the a new one, well then you know he'll force himself onto the NHL roster and you don't have to worry about, oh, it's going to be like nearly a, like a month practically before mm-hmm. you you can actually fold them into the lineup. Well, that's it. It's not worth calling a guy for two games for two weeks here, two weeks back of quarantine. Mm-hmm. You know, but like you said, this makes everything a lot easier and and easier to move guys up and down on that list as needed, but I think also easier for them to really see what they've got. Yeah. Outside of the forwards, I'm just looking at the Stockton roster. There's really not a lot of guys I'm excited by. Carl John Lurby, Yellison, uh, Jonas Kinnevel, Colton Poolman, and Alex Petrovic are the defensemen. There's really nothing there that we, you know, we have to watch this year. Oh, uh, uh, Kinnevel's not bad. Uh, he played well in Sweden, so, like, that would be the name on the list that would be the standout guy yeah but Yellison i don't think can, with, with the depth the flames have it's not like next year yeah. he's going to be tearing it up here no and like mackie shellington and yellison i would assume would be like the three top guys and then and then you're a goalie walk. man it'll be interesting to see what they do in net with wolf parsons and zags all uh pro this year yeah i i would assume that wolf would go to like the echl and parsons and zag split yeah, is is Wolf still eligible to be loaned back to his uh, his CHL yeah. team? Yeah, so uh, that might be a better fit. It, it might be worth loaning him back to the CHL. We'll get starter minutes. Then when their shortened season's over, bring him up and, like you said, dump him in the E or something like that later. Yeah. Um, knowing Parsons, I'm not convinced he'll stay healthy, so maybe by that point, Wolf will be your, your number two. Yeah. Knock on wood. It, yeah, it, goaltenders... <laughs> It is frustrating at the best of times, but thankfully with Markstrom, that's kind of a it'll sort itself out issue instead of we need a goalie now. <laughs> yeah, like I'm just looking at the guys here that I would put on that taxi squad: um, Richie, Byron Ferrosi. Those are really the two names that you know. If I'm going to pull yeah. guys off that squad to sit on the to ride the pine, yeah. it's those two. And if you needed a defenseman, Yellison would be. I'd take Petrovic over Yellison. Yeah. Again, I think Yellison has some uh, those value. Would be the, you know, like if you're trading uh, Shillington and Mackey, two for two type of thing, th- then Petrovic and him would be the two. Yeah, I think Shillington's got some value, and I think they just want to, you know, put him in the A for a little bit, a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah, and Shillington needs to play, and you know, like uh, watching Brett Kulak play with uh, Montreal the last couple games, like I see a lot of Oliver Shillington in brett kulak and i think that like if the flames were to trade him that he would eventually figure out how to be a like a three four guy in much the way that kulak is with montreal and yeah and as you've talked about this team is deep right and there's often it's like you might not be the three four guy here sort of like you were saying with sam bennett right you might move somewhere else and you might be your first or second um left winger centerman but the option just not open here yeah and that that's not a slight on anybody like it's just calgary is one of the deepest teams in the nhl it, yep. it happens you know and and at some point is that's as, a good problem for us as the rock you say at some point you just need to know your role right and if your role is the number three center the number six defenseman be the best number six you can and when an injury happens show us you can do more yeah and like you look at guys as they're getting older like michael backland you know the third line center spot is available and like a guy like Connor Zari, like when he's developing, you know, I'm sure he has his eyes on that. And, you know, like Sam Bennett could have his eyes on that. And, you know, Valimaki and Hannafin are looking at Giordano's spot and, you know, like. Yeah. And we, we talk about a lot too, but I think, you know, for fans, there's two types of prospects, right? There's the prospect you bring in to put on that third line who you expect to rise up the, 
the depth chart very quickly. And then there's the guy who you put there because that's where he belongs. You know, and I think even a guy like Glenn Godden, we're starting to see maybe that's where he would belong is that third or fourth line center. And, you know, not everyone who bring you bring up is going to have that ability to become your number one center. Yeah, like Glenn Godden, I think the ideal world would be a replacement for Derek Ryan as the fourth line center. Yeah, and, nothing wrong with I, that. You're still in the show. No, yeah. It's just that um, I think that, like, his career, he's going to be that quality fourth line center who just plays the game smart and effective and you know kills the penalties and does the responsible things and the you know not you know wanting to create as few chances at either end as possible yeah you know make it as boring as possible when you're out there and i, I did my job that's I'm right mr yep. boring <laughs> and and you know i mean we, I, I can already hear some people saying well he might not be nhl center yet but remember that you know we're getting the talent pool diluted again next year 32 new Jobs are going to be in the league, you know, for every player that gets taken in the expansion draft, NHL teams have to replace them. So there's going to be guys that aren't in the NHL now that might be simply because now there's 32 more jobs in the league. Yeah. And by the way, I would also keep Sam Bennett for expansion purposes. And We talked about that a few shows ago. I think if yeah, there, like, there's always yeah, that yeah, fine I, balance, right? I mean, do you want to lose yeah. him for nothing or, but yeah, I think if he's available, yeah, he gets like, taken. He, yeah, like, honestly, to me, looking at the options available, you know, like, the Flames are going to have to lose somebody, and that might be the problem that solves itself, if that makes sense. If, you know, like, I, I'm not in any rush, you know, because at worst, you're going to get the good playoff out of Sam Bennett, and then, yeah, okay, you know. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah no you you could definitely be right on that one i think if bennett's available he gets taken but i also think that there will be a desire in the organization to try and move him potentially before he gets taken to get some value out of him um yeah but i would be shocked if let's say after that expansion draft he's still a flame by hook or by crook i think he'll be either taken yeah. or traded for something yeah and, you know, we got to remember, we got off easy last time. I mean, we lost England, who was a free agent anyways and probably wouldn't have re-signed here because he lives in Vegas. So it's kind of our turn to lose something. Yeah. And, well, the only team that really lost less was Edmonton, and it was like, oh, we but have the, to take somebody. <laughs> but Edmonton had less to give up, right? True. Uh, that that really was a good trade, though, for Edmonton uh, Get giving up Matthew Barzal and Anthony Beauvillier for Griffin Reinhardt. Just a awesome trade there. And you know, Worked I mean, really there's, well, well, we'll see what happens <laughs> the next year before the expansion draft too, but I can see, you know, him being moved somewhere who, you know, needs a forward to be exposed or something like that as well. So, so we'll, we'll see what happens, yeah. but I agree with you. I think that either by expansion draft or by trade, I don't see Backlund being here when Seattle hits the ice. Yeah. Well, Matt, I think that about wraps it up this week. Uh, all we have left to do is look at uh, how the team did and then think about what we think we're going to get out of them this week, the, the most frustrating part of the show. Yes, the part where Matthew is always wrong. That's right. <laughs> well, I haven't been doing too well either. So uh, last week, as we know, the Flames ended up winning one game against Montreal, lost to Toronto Montreal as well. I thought we'd win both Montreal games and lose Toronto. You thought we'd win one Toronto Montreal and lose to Montreal. So you kind of got things backwards from what actually happened yeah so we this week kind of did so yeah it, yeah <laughs> this week as we move into february four games in the docket we have a road trip to winnipeg we play there monday night tuesday night and thursday night in winnipeg so that's the start of really our baseball schedule on the road if you will then we come back here saturday night for hockey night in canada an 8 p.m start to take on the edmonton oilers in the saddle dome and that concludes the week so four games in the docket how do you think we're gonna do man i'm gonna go win 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 four wins yeah i think that um markstrom's win against uh montreal and the team showing a little bit more emotion i think that that might be a catalyst to get this team on the go and frankly winnipeg and edmonton are bad 
So if the Flames are on a roll, then yeah, they should win all four. And you know, it it's I I'm expecting a 500, but you know, like I think that they have a bit of a role in them right now, and we'll see. Do you think Marstrom, so you're saying Marstrom um, will have a good week, and I agree with you. Do you think he plays both back-to-backs? No, I, I think that Riddick uh, plays the second one, and I think that uh, he'll get his first win. So considering the Flames usually do the opposite of what you predict in this game, that means we're probably going to get skunked this week and be lower than Ottawa in the well, standings. Well, I'm expecting a, a 500 but I'm predicting a four-game winning okay. streak. I'm g- I'm gonna go 500. I think they'll win the first game against Winnipeg. I think they'll lose the second one with Riddick and Net, and I think that they will get down on themselves and lose the third one because of it too. But then I think they will f- they will beat Edmonton because that's not much of a challenge. Yeah, it's like if you can contain McDavid and Drysaitel, you've won. <laughs> And we also have to remember going into Winnipeg that they don't have Line A in the lineup because he's been traded, and they probably won't have uh, Dubois yet because of the uh, the COVID protocols. Yeah, so, if I recall correctly, Dubois should make his debut in the third game, but he might miss that one. Too. I heard that's uh, even iffy. Yeah. So but we'll he's, see. He's we'll definitely Winni- see him next week because we play them again next week. But, that's right yeah 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 I, I i heard that he's in winnipeg so it's not like they'd have to fly him in for that third game but i think it depends on exactly how things work there mm-hmm. so yeah so four games this will be the busiest week for the flames so far and i think that's going to tell us a lot too is uh what can they do when they're busy when the aches and well, pains start to and, creep in yeah and also like all four of the games are kind of against middle of the road to bad ish teams like I would not expect either of these teams to make the postseason, so like Winnipeg has a better chance, but I don't think either would. So, you know, it's yeah, like they sh- should, should, but yeah, we'll see. Well, and and on that, I mean, if we look ahead to the rest of February. We play another, you know, we play a series against Vancouver, another game against Winnipeg, more Edmonton. Like, really, the only, by your logic of, you know, teams should be in the playoffs, the only real challenge this month should be two games against Toronto. Yeah. Well, and that's why the Flames, I think a lot of their problems should sort themselves out sooner than later, just due to the fact that, like, there are only... Really, Montreal and Toronto, and like even Montreal is not really a playoff caliber team in a normal year. So, like, really, it's Toronto that's good. And then Montreal, Winnipeg, Ottawa, and Vancouver, and Edmonton are all kind of in that. Like, should finish between 6th and 12th in the standings group. And yeah, so the Flames are going to be playing a lot of mediocre teams talent wise they should win most but you know should and do so in 20 27 days they have 15 games they play four of them against winnipeg four of them against vancouver three of them against edmonton two against toronto and two against ottawa so a lot of hockey to be played this month yeah and a lot of mediocre opponents that they should win but will they? And As that, you and I that, talked about at the top of the show, just because they look good on paper doesn't mean they're a good team. No, and Treliving even said that uh, before the season started, that, like, paper's great, but, you know, you have to actually apply it. And this team, you know, like, in order to take that next step to be the elite team, to dominate everything, you know, they have the best goalie in the division, they have the best forward and defense group combined. You got everything you need. Go to it. You know, like they should be massacring this month. <laughs> We've talked about a lot today. I'm sure that some of you guys agree with us and some of you guys disagree with us. Maybe you think, you know, Matt's a genius and I'm an idiot or vice versa. Um, let yeah. us Let us know. 
get, reach out to us on social media on facebook we're facebook.com slash fireside chat on twitter we're at fireside podcast um, we're on instagram at fireside chat underscore podcast but we don't use as much or give us a phone call we have a voicemail number i promise i won't pick up but you can call and leave us a voicemail um, and that number is 587 200 either voicemail or a text. And we'd love to uh, read some of your comments on the show, some of your thoughts, and see what you guys think about some of the, the core of this team and what needs to be done to get them going. Yeah, and I must say that when we have episodes like this where like we're not on the same page, that's really interesting because it makes us both think about the other person's point of view and you know, and it gives something to watch during the games to see, you know, if what either of us is saying is accurate. I or get great pride wrong. when I can come back and say, Matt, you were wrong. Yes, and vice versa. <laughs> so, we'll see. And knowing our luck, because we're saying this, we'll both be wrong, and then there you go. <laughs> they'll they'll end up uh, tra- trading Sam Bennett to a non-NHL team, and then they'll show us both. Yes. He got option to the KHL. <laughs> then we're really screwed. Yes. <laughs> well, um, before we go, I just want to say happy birthday to Jacob Markstrom. He turns 31 today. So uh, first year of a six-year deal, and he's already aged one year for us. So his 31st birthday and that shutout last night was a great birthday present for him. Yeah, and hopefully he continues to have a really good season. Then. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.